अमित सर यस सर स्टार्ट ओके तो कंटिन्यू एडमिट हो रहा है ना मेरे आई विल अलाउ यू जस्ट कंटिन्यू ओके सर नाउ वी कैन स्टार्ट आई थिंक Uh, just before going to start, just I need a bit confirmation from your end. Audio and video visibility is okay, sir. Fine. Fine, fine. Audio, video, fine. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, very good evening to all respected professors, faculty members, and participants. Myself, uh, Dr. Amit Agarwal, and today I got the opportunity to host this session. I welcome to all of you on last day of this FDP on electric vehicles, new trends, and technologies. The today's topic for discussion is advanced driver assistance system for safe and efficient driving with electric vehicles. So, without taking your much time, I would like to call Professor Heman Tahuja, Head of Electrical and Electronics Engineering Department, for welcoming our today's expert speaker, Dr. Bidatri Malik, ma'am, and addressing our all participants. Too. Dr. Tahuja, please. Yes, sir. Please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for such a nice welcome on behalf of entire ABS family. Before inviting Dr. Bedatri Malik, with due respect and permission, I would like to read her academic credential. Dr. Bedatri Malik has completed her bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering from West Bengal University of Technology, WBUT, Kolkata, and her PhD degree in the field of electric and hybrid vehicle power management. From University of Dusseldorf in Germany in 2016, she has been serving Amity University ever since as an as assistant professor. She is continuing her research in the field of EVs and HEVs and extending her expertise to involve as many student faculty as possible in his unique domain. I would like to welcome you again, ma'am. Please take the charge and share your knowledge with all of us. Please, ma'am, take the charge. Thank you, thank you for the nice introduction. I will just start the slide show. Uh, share my slides. Okay. 
are the uh, is my screen visible to everyone yeah, it's a being coming okay is it visible right now uh, yes okay so yes my topic is on advanced driving assistance systems for safe and efficient driving with electric vehicles so this topic is mainly it, it mainly deals with how a driver assistance system has to be tailor made for electric vehicles so we talk about driver assistance systems we talk about the safety aspects about lane change departure warnings about seat belt warning about pedestrian detection warning but driver assistance systems when someone is driving with an electric or a hybrid vehicle then what are the extra features it has to incorporate to make it an advanced driver assistance systems so that is what i will discuss in this uh, session of mine first of all yeah you all know what are the environmental aspects what are the bad aspects of conventional vehicles the pollution and the scarcity of fossil fuels so it drives us all to look for alternative sources of power to combat pollution and also to solve the problem of uh, fuel scarcity another major problem which is uh, there in the transportation sector is the is a road safety aspect so increase in road accidents and safety features lead us to think that how we can enhance our uh, you know systems to make it more automatic as in to prevent or to at least minimize the uh, errors caused by humans so to minimize human error and also to uh, maximize the driving performance so there are two aspects of you know the road safety you have to minimize the human errors and you have to also maximize the comfort or the driver you know uh, experience of driving so these are the two aspects but uh, the question is what happens when we are driving electric what happens when we are driving an electric vehicle then we have to also think of efficient driving along with safe driving okay now what is how can this be achieved this can be achieved by uh, mainly two ways so we can look about if we improving the efficiency in driving by basically two methods one is either we change the global traffic management system so we change the way you know the traffic signals work we change the way the the car stops at different places and moves so that uh, there is more efficiency in driving in terms of energy efficiency fuel efficiency or we try to change the way the power is circulated inside the vehicle so as to have a more efficient uh, power transmission that is one thing the other thing is that we can develop cooperative systems where vehicles communicate with one another they communicate with the surroundings or they communicate with other sources of information you know which are there everywhere like in the infrastructure or gps or whatever so the key here is intelligent transportation systems which have to have inclusion of artificial intelligence in development of driver assistance systems so if we take a look at the difference between conventional and electric vehicles you already know that conventional vehicles have purely mechanical power train they are based on fossil fuels whereas electric and hybrid vehicles they can have either electric transmission or electromechanical transmission so transmission system is one difference the other difference is the kind of power source used so they can be powered by batteries fuel cells fuel cell battery engine battery so the power source is different transmission is different another major thing is that they utilize uh, the energy gained back from regenerative braking which is not there in conventional vehicles there is also an upcoming possibility of using supercapacitors as you all know supercapacitors are also being considered as an alternative source in electric vehicles so if we take a look at the propulsion power the power sources used in electric vehicles majorly batteries or fuel cells or supercapacitors we take a look at the different characteristics of each of them then we will see that they have certain advantages they have certain disadvantages and the features are such that an optimal usage would be to combine the sources i mean even if we talk about an electric vehicle it may not be only a battery electric vehicle so we may have more electric power sources which when combined to form a hybrid electric vehicle in that sense so it can be a hybrid of two or more sources electric sources okay so if we take a look at the batteries the features of batteries 
yes batteries have uh, you know higher energy density so they can store more charge but the problem is that they have a, a shorter cycle life they have a lower power density supercapacitors on the other hand cannot store much charge they have lower energy density but they have a higher power density so they can transfer power very quickly fuel cells again have a problem that they have a much longer response time compared to battery and supercapacitor but the advantage is that fuel cells can act as a prime mover so you know don't need any plugging in based on where these sources are so that these are the three major sources now how these sources are combined whether one of the sources is present or more than one source is present and how they are connected or how they are combined gives rise to different kinds of vehicles so you can have a battery electric vehicle like the bev or you can have a plug in hybrid vehicle phev or a hybrid electric vehicle so you see the thing is the for the bev with the battery is the sole power source uh, it requires plugging in it has to be plugged in whereas a hybrid electric vehicle hev does not require plugging in because it has the engine it is a combination of the engine and the battery so the engine can act as a prime mover the plug in hybrid vehicle has the advantage of both bev and hev as in it has a battery it has an engine and it can still be plugged in so it can give an extended range then we can have the fuel cell vehicle fuel cell vehicles have got some disadvantages because of which they they are being considered and they are being considered to be you know hybridized with supercapacitor or battery and supercapacitor that is being considered here are some examples and uh, some of them are still in the development stage but these are the examples the vehicles which are already there in the market now if we take a look at the differences or the what should i say the different architectures of these vehicles then uh, there is a broad classification which can be made based on four things number one is that you can classify the vehicles based on the sources of energy so for example you look at the i don't know if my mouse is working yes my mouse is working so if you look at this one the conventional vehicle the source of energy is only petrol diesel whatever hybrid vehicle has the petrol diesel and the battery plug in has the petrol diesel the battery requires plugging in and all electric is just battery so the source of energy based on source of energy you can have conventional hybrid plug in and all electric then again you can classify based on the degree of hybridization so for example you see this picture here you see there are different kinds of vehicles so the conventional vehicle is somewhere here it uses entirely the internal combustion engine whereas the micro hybrid electric vehicle uses a part of the electric motor just for startup and it cannot even realize regenerative braking so it just uses the electric motor for starting up and you have the medium mild hybrid electric vehicle which sort of can realize regenerative braking and it does utilize more of electric energy than the internal combustion engine the full hybrid vehicle uses 50 50% of both and the plug in hybrid vehicle uses much more electric energy than internal combustion engine so this is based on the degree of hybridization then again you can classify electric vehicles based on how the components are connected so you can have the parallel hybrid parallel means the engine and the motor are connected separately individually to the wheels you can have a series ha series hybrid where the engine is connected to the wheels so the, there is no direct connection between the engine and the wheels or you can have a parallel hybrid oh, sorry series parallel hybrid where you have uh, both options you can have a series structure also you can have a parallel structure also the last one is based on utilization of energy so what energy is what is using i mean whether the ev is whether the vehicle is using more of fossil fuel or more of battery power more of maybe hydrogen or fuel so these are the classifications of the electric and hybrid fuel cell vehicles okay next we come to an automotive power train so uh, i think this is quite clear to the mechanical engineers or automo automobile engineers but i mean just to give you an idea of what the automotive power train actually has so it has a prime mover here which can be either an engine or it can be an electric motor it can be an engine in case of a hybrid or an electric vehicle 
this engine or the prime mover torque and speed is what gets transmitted to the wheels through the clutch through the transmission through the final drive the differential and it ultimately goes to the drive shaft which drives the wheels now each of these components have got a role here for example the the clutch here the clutch tries to the, the clutch tries to disengage and engage the prime mover okay the clutch disengages and engages the prime mover whenever uh, whenever it is required to shift the gears for example Okay, the gearbox here supplies a few gear ratios, for example, one, two, three, four, maybe gear ratios to match the input shaft and output shaft speed. The final drive also supplies a few more further speed reduction. And finally, you have the differential, which distributes the torque amongst the two wheels. Now, if you take a look at the characteristics, so I was talking about the prime mover, right? So the prime mover can either be an internal combustion engine or it can be an electric motor. So if you take a look at the characteristics of the internal combustion engine and the electric motor, then it becomes more clear how you would want to do machines. So this one is the characteristic of an ideal machine. So this is the torque characteristic and the power characteristic of how an ideal prime mover should be. But if you take, uh, that means what does this characteristic represent? It characteristically presents that the prime mover should ideally have an almost constant power performance throughout the speed range and the torque should be constrained to be kept constant at a lower speed range okay so it gives a high tractive effort and it gradually you know decreases hyperbolically power should remain constant but if you take a look at the actual characteristics of the internal combustion engine and of the electric motor you will see that the internal combustion engine has a characteristic torque power characteristic which is far from ideal whereas the electric motor has a torque power characteristic which is very very close to the ideal so what they do is um, yeah the engine the torque falls after a certain speed the power increases to a maximum point after which the losses in the air manifold increase and then the power also falls so what they do is they use multi gear transmission to make this characteristic as close as ideal as possible okay so the more gear ratios you have the gear ratio should be chosen in such a way that this characteristic should be as close to ideal as possible all right now the next uh, thing is the battery so engines and motors are one thing the batteries have a completely different characteristic i mean the batteries batteries as prime movers are a completely different thing because they can directly power the electric machine and they have they are complete they are a source of electrical power unlike the internal combustion engine so they can be used to directly drive the electric motor and it can be directly connected to the wheels so you need an inverter in between because then it can get the power back and charge uh, the battery and if you take a look at the batteries you know, these are the popularly used batteries in electric vehicles you have the lead acid lead acids are no longer considered an option why because they have very poor cycle life they have uh, you know the, the, the cycle life is very poor they have their very poor energy density they are heavy and bulky so you need a much bigger battery to store small amount of charge okay nickel metal hydrides are somewhere in between uh, lithium ion and lead acid so nickel metal hydrides have got better characteristics as compared to lead acid but poor in comparison to lithium ion they have higher energy density as compared to lead acid but less energy density compared to lithium ion moreover nickel metal hydrides has got one advantage that it can uh, it uh, the, the material used to make this battery is less toxic than lithium ion and the cost is also less than lithium ion lithium ion is nevertheless the best uh, choice for electric vehicles they have uh, Uh, very good power and energy density now what is this power and energy density so this plot here is called a ragon plot and here we plot specific energy versus specific power so what is the specific energy and specific power you see this one handles this specific energy means how much energy it can store and specific power means how much power it can deliver per you know in a given period of time so if you take a look at where which of these components lie 
you'll see that internal combustion engine somewhere here. So they have the best power and the best energy density. Capacitors are somewhere here, supercapacitors or ultra capacitors, whatever. They have got a higher power density but a lower energy density. So they can transmit power very quickly, the charge and discharge very quickly, but they can store not so much amount of power. Batteries are somewhere here, that is, batteries are here. Lithium and batteries are here. So they have uh, definitely better, they are somewhere in between. They have good power and good energy density. Fuel cells are here. They have very poor power density. Okay, so anyways, now when we talk about batteries, we also have to talk about associated technology. Now, if we talk about electric vehicles, then what we should remember is that the, any kind of improvement in the electric vehicle range, efficiency, safety, reliability, and lifetime are entirely dependent on the design and chemistry of the pack. That's one thing. And the associated systems. So associated systems means this battery management system. So battery management system is the key to how the battery will perform during its life inside the electric vehicle. So if we cannot change, the, if once the chemistry of the battery is decided, then it is the it is up to the battery management system to to, you know, control the battery uh, states so it has got various tasks this is the task these are the this is a summarization of the tasks of the battery management systems you have uh, a, a module for thermal management for example for controlling the heating and cooling of the batteries then you have uh, here for example cell voltage measurement you know cell level measurements and so on and so forth but what is the most important thing when you are designing a battery management system. The most important thing is that you have to first estimate the battery states. So batteries, so you have to estimate these states and the corresponding parameters like temperature and voltage or current, the associated parameters, and eventually you have to determine these states accurately in real time. That is the thing about battery management system. So, if you take a look at the state estimation, I mean, what is the most important, the heart of a battery management system? First of all, the heart of electric vehicle, take the basic structure of a battery management system. You see, the first thing is you have to acquire certain data, like acquire the different electrical parameters, thermal parameters, voltage, current, temperature. And then you have to have a model inside the bat inside the system, and you have a software model maybe an electrical model, maybe an electrochemical model or a thermal model, which can estimate how the battery states are going to be in real time. So battery state of charge, state of health, whatever. And accordingly, it is going to give a signal to the management system. It's going to be communicated via the CAN bus to the safety supervisor. So the safety supervisor is going to constantly monitor the battery states and it will take control if it goes if the states go beyond a certain limit or it will try to if it's a hybrid vehicle it can try to uh, well uh, use the other source maybe if it's a hybrid vehicle with another engine connected to it it will try to use the engine more if the, if the states of the battery are you know it's not in the optimal limits anyways so the key thing here is the pattern parameter estimation the states estimation and there are different approaches how these states can be estimated. Okay, so one way of estimating the state of charge is the direct approach. So we can have an ampere R method where you measure the current, integrate it over time, and you say that this is how the current is varying over a certain period of time. Or you can have a model based method where you have equivalent circuit models, you make an electrical model or you make an electrochemical model, and you say that this model represents the phenomena happening inside the batteries. And uh, based on this model, we can say that the state of charge is so and so. Okay, that is about state of charge. State of health is a figure of merit. It means that how much more life and to estimate the state of health. So here again, you have some model-based approaches, some model-free approaches. Temperature estimation is also a very important feature because it directly affects the, both the states. So temperature if not, temperature rise can cause uh, can be disastrous for the ve vehicle, for the battery, for the driver safety. So some estimation methods are required, and 
um, there are different methods for estimating states as I told you. The key thing here is to consider aging models. So how can you represent the phenomena happening inside the battery? Lifetime phenomena, long-term phenomena, transient phenomena with the help of a model or with the help of maps so that you can estimate the states. Okay. Now, why is it so important? Why is uh, state estimation so important? Because uh, you see there are certain phenomena happening inside the battery. One such phenomena is called the aging phenomena. There are other phenomena also. And all these phenomena which happen inside the battery cause it to degrade over time. Like, for example, this diagram shows that what happens, uh, what are the few things which can happen? One is, one is the calendar aging process. So the battery, even if it is not used, it is kept over a period of time, it will age. And what deteriorates it is the temperature and the state of charge. Then again, you can have some manufacturing level problems, defects. Once the battery is, uh, you know, it's running, it's in the running condition, then again, two things affect it. The cycle number and the cycle aging. So cycle numbers, just like the way your time or calendar causes it to age, and the amplitude of the cycles also lead to different, you know, uh, types of aging. Then again, there are environmental conditions, like stress, temperature, and so on and so forth. So ultimately, all these factors together cause the battery to degrade. And if the battery degrades, then it is very difficult to accurately estimate its state of charge. So state of charge and state of health are interdependent. If it is aging, we have to have a proper mechanism to determine the life of the battery and accordingly what is the charge holding capacity of the battery. Okay, all we know is that aging decreases the battery's usable capacity and it increases its internal resistance. So it affects the battery's lifespan. Okay, so this is about this thing here. We talked about uh, the power sources, the engine, the motor, the battery. So what are the different power sources used in the battery, used in the electric vehicle? Now we are talking about the transmission system. So what are the different kinds of transmission you have in an automotive power train? First of all, you can have a series transmission. I think I told you before also that you can either have the engine directly connected to the wheels. Or you can have a parallel transmission where the engine is connected separately and the motor is connected separately to the wheels. So both can drive the wheels individually. Or you can have a series parallel transmission or a complex transmission. So here, these two kind of transmissions can realize both series and parallel transmission. Anyway, so what is the transmission system? What kind of transmission system is used in uh, electric and hybrid vehicles? So let me first take the example of a hybrid vehicle. And a classic example is from Toyota Prius. So this is how the transmission system was originally designed for Toyota Prius hybrid vehicles, power split hybrid vehicle. So what is the main feature of this power split device is that if you have two sources of power, you have the engine here, you have the generator here, and you have the motor here. I mean, they can be interchanged. So generator can act as a motor, motor can act as a generator. And uh, in between, they connect something called the planetary gear setup. Now, there is something very special about this kind of transmission, this kind of power split transmission, we call it, because this kind of transmission can allow all the three machines, the engine, the motor, and the generator to operate independently or to operate together. It can be operated like a series hybrid also. It can work like a parallel hybrid also. It acts like a CVT and it does not, you don't require, uh, you know, a transmission system at all. Now, how does it work? So you have a sun gear here in between, which is connected to the generator. You have a ring gear outside, which is connected to the motor. And you have a planetary carrier in between, which is connected to the engine. Now, what happens is when the vehicle just starts, when the engine is still stationary, engine is not moving, then what happens is that uh, this ring gear, by the way, which is connected to the motor, it decides the actual speed of the vehicle. So this is connected to the output axle. So the speed of the wheel is decided by the ring gear or the motor. So when the car starts, this ring gear starts to spin. And when this ring gear spins, 
then these uh, planets will also spin and they will start this generator so it can start uh, with the help of the generator once the vehicle accelerates and goes beyond a certain speed then the engine is turned on the moment the engine turns on then this planetary this this planetary carrier will start moving and if this planetary carrier starts moving this generator will suddenly change its speed okay then uh, it can uh, stabilize itself and then it can the, the wheel speed can be adjusted accordingly so the wind gear will again the now speed the spin at the speed at which the engine is driving it all right so this is the innovative way by which they are using both engine and generator you know and motor all together so this is one example now if you have a power split device like this this is a case of a hybrid vehicle where the engine is there now what happens if you have an electric vehicle purely electric there is no engine then there are different ways in which you can have a transmission you can have uh, either you know motor gearbox differential or you may el eliminate all of them and just have the motor connected directly or embedded inside the wheels of the uh, or you eliminate the clutch the gearbox and differential you just have the motor which are there inside the wheels this is one way you can have an electric uh, transmission you don't need a transmission so this kind of a thing is called a four wheel drive and it offers a lot of uh, uh, degrees of freedom but the problem is it is also complex to control the other options are you can also have a fixed gear system like here the fixed gear system all right now how do you realize the power split then so this is one option how you can have a transmission in electric vehicle so how is the power split realized if you have more than one source suppose you are talking about an electric vehicle but you have two sources you have a battery and a super capacitor so how will you realize the power split then because now you don't have a mechanical you know sun gear ring gear arrangement so then they have the dc dc converters so dc dc converters have got many multiple purposes in electric vehicle apart from just boosting up and you know just the bug boost of apart from the bug boost operation it also has a role in power management so you can send the desired uh, power you know that is to be taken from the battery and super capacitor and you can change this dc dc converter you can give a desired current signal to this dc dc converter and can accordingly split the power so you have different configurations out of which this is called the fully active configuration so you have two dc dc converters and this offers the highest degrees of freedom okay okay so this was about how you can do the power split now the question is what is power split what are the what is the uh, what are the softwares or how you would control the power split with the help of a power management controller so one example again from the toyota prius this is a power split control based on some rules so what they do is there has to be some rules defined in the logic of the power management which says that what are the different modes in which the the vehicle can drive so one mode is that you that that, you, that is during the starting or during the low to mid speed range only the battery can be used to propel the vehicle the other mode says that okay when driving under normal conditions uh, the generator can also assist so the other mode says that okay if there is a sudden acceleration then both the generator and the battery can be used to move the vehicle then there can be another rule which says that when there is deceleration braking then the Uh, power can be transmitted back to the battery or if there is battery recharging mode then the engine connected to the generator can charge the battery so this is called power management control based on rules so there are some rules which is you know this is the common thing that they have in the hybrid cars uh, that you see so toyota prius has this kind of a rule based control the other hybrid cars also have some kind of rule based control which which define certain rules of how the power has to be channeled to the different components so there has to be a goal or a, an objective of this kind of power management control so what is the objective of this kind of a power management control so you can have here so like suppose we have multiple sources in the vehicle we have source 1 source 2 converter 1 converter 
then uh, the question of power split is how much power is being utilized from source 1, how much from source 2, so as to channel it to the load or to drive the load. Similarly, when the load is recuperating or regenerating, how much power has to go to source 1, how much has to go to source 2. So, this kind of a power management uh, control kind of a thing has to be done with a certain objective. So, one common objective is to minimize the fuel consumption. So, you may want to channel the powers, you know, you have to decide the rules in such a way so that your primary source 1, which is probably an engine or a fuel cell, it consumes less fuel. Or you can do it based on electricity cost. So, you minimize the electricity cost. So, you can also talk about energy consumption and not fuel consumption. That is, how much energy is coming out of the battery, how much energy is going into the battery. Or you can talk about efficiency. So, there has to be certain optimization objective behind the power management control. Okay. So, that is one thing. The other thing is that apart from the optimization objective, when you are talking about power management, you also have to keep the drive cycle into mind. Now, what is a drive cycle? A drive cycle is the way a driver drives. So, there, there are some standard profiles which are available in the databases of most of the cars which is that they say that okay fine if the driver is driving in a highway then he is supposed to follow this kind of a driving cycle this kind of a profile if he is uh, driving in a city maybe this is the way his velocity will vary over time so these are nothing but velocity time profiles of how the driver is driving in different driving conditions but the problem is that when you estimate the fuel or energy consumption of a vehicle then you take some standard drive cycles and based on that you conduct some chassis dynamometer tests and you establish that so and so is the energy consumption but all the aspects of the main aspects of a, of a power management or energy management or battery management has to be done taking into account the fact that these cycles are not known in advance these cycles are not real they are just some standard cycles which are taken for testing purposes so it is important to consider that some kind of a you know artificial intelligence tool is required for prediction recognition of this cycle in real time where we don't know the cycle in advance this is one thing and then again there is the optimization part like i was telling you that you may have um, a common optimization objective can be the fuel consumption or the energy consumption so you have to have this power management control or rather an optimal power management control where you specify the optimization objective like say minimization of fuel consumption and you specify the constraints like for example you say that this state of charge of the battery or the state of charge of the supercapacitor has to be penalized within a certain limit and then you can have an optimal you know power management uh, control formulation which you can then use and yeah so based on how the power management is done like new based is just one technique there are many, many categories of power management uh, algorithms which are there in the literature, which are still in the development stage, which are being widely researched. So, rule-based is one technique and optimization-based is another technique. So, the rule-based one, which I was showing you from the Toyota Prius example, has a problem. That the fixed set of rules which you are designing, if then rules, need not be optimal. So, you need not be able to say that my... Uh, you know, minimum fuel consumption at so and so point is the minimum, is the, is the global minimum. So, optimization stra based strategies are more, uh, you know, uh, they're improved that way, but they can establish uh, an optimum point of fuel consumption. So, but then again, rule based have got some advantages. They have got the deterministic rule based, they have on off control, like the engine is turned on, turned off. They have frequency based methods where what they do is they allow the battery to take lower frequencies, they take the supercapacitor to take higher frequencies, then they have adaptive rule based, they have fuzzy rule based, then they have fuzzy rule based, and then they also have predictive based strategies. And um, optimization based strategies are again uh, different as in they have this dynamic optimization. So you all have heard of probably dynamic programming. Dynamic programming, which is based on the Bellman's principle, it says that, okay, fine, you have a certain states, 
and how the states are evolving over time so you can find you can keep on com computing the states at each point of time and you evaluate the cost function but that is not uh, the cost function which you are doing for the entire cycle you are doing it in a state based approach so you have a grid of certain points how the states are evolving and for each of the states each of the convolution of state you are evaluating a cost to go function so dynamic programming is one method in which you can have a global optimum then you also have methods like genetic algorithms so genetic algorithms are also optimization based where you say that okay fine you generate a set of uh, individuals a population of uh, individuals and uh, then you select uh, two best individuals which are giving you the lowest cost function and you allow them to mate mutate crossover and you get newer generations so every time you keep on searching the entire space to find the best individuals which give you the minimum fuel consumption so but all these methods and like dynamic programming or genetic algorithms they are based on the fact that the drive cycle has to be known in advance so if the drive cycle is not known in advance they will not be able to give you an optimal solution so real time optimization has got solutions for example ecms and model predictive control they are uh, more useful in giving you a solution when the drive cycle is not known at once anyway before i go into details of all this let us talk about driver assistance systems as well now where is the point where you know the power management control and the driver assistance systems intersect so driver assistance systems like i told you can be of different kinds you can have adaptive cruise control everything starting from seat belt warning to pedestrian crossing detection tire pressure monitoring they are all driver assistance systems so where is it or which aspect of driver assistance systems is relevant to the electric or hybrid vehicle power management so driver assistance systems for electric vehicles or for hybrid vehicles so when you are talking about introducing artificial intelligence in power management as in you have to you don't know the drive cycle in advance you want to predict the drive cycle or you want to recognize the drive cycle you have to take a few things into account more of those things you have to take into account what the driving style vehicle is driving monitoring systems are also available they are more useful when you are talking about the safety aspect like detecting the driver stick the drowsiness and inattention so these are about driver monitoring systems but when you are talking about the power management part or you are talking about how to uh, well forecast the driving pattern of the driver how to forecast the driving cycle of the driver you have to talk about you have to take into account two things one is the style of the driver and the other is condition okay so style is influenced by environmental factors and human factors all right so you have traffic weather and so on and you have human factors so you have to understand what the driving style of the driver is and you have to understand what is the condition of the driver so is it accelerating is it decelerating is it a highway driving condition urban or suburban driving condition so uh, both of them together using both the information together you can generate a driving pattern and based on the driving pattern you can tune your power management controller to give you an optimal power split between the different components of the ring all right so some techniques for driving style and driving condition monitoring you have something called supervised techniques and unsupervised techniques they are all learning techniques how you can uh, you know uh, if you can train and you can use the model for classification of the driving pattern how you can recognize or predict the driving pattern So here are the basic steps steps for classification you have to collect the data first that means all this is done to to predict what the driving cycle will be in the future so you have to first collect the data so you have to know how the driver is what is the driving trend of the driver so you can connect either the real data from a vehicle or you can use a driving simulator environment to see how the how the how the driver is driving you have to extract the characteristic features for example you have to see how the velocity is varying over time what is the maximum acceleration maximum deceleration and so on 
you have to cluster it into broad categories. So you can say that if the acceleration is beyond so and so threshold, you call it highway driving. If the deceleration is, um, if the acceleration deceleration ratio is so and so, then it is a uh, city driving. So you have to classify it, cluster it, and then you have to select the length, the time window. So what is the time window in which you are? Based on your classification, accuracy of classification, then you can say that okay, fine. This is the current drive cycle that the power management uh, has to get tuned according to. Okay, so we have uh, these are some of the driver assistance systems. The problem is that they are non-adaptive. So you have all these systems, but they are not adaptable to the actual uh, drive cycle, which is there, which has to be recognized. This author has tried to make an adaptive system, which is there for three kinds of, uh, which is performing three kinds of tasks: the comfort, the security, and the safety. All three of them. And uh, similarly, you have something like here. Uh, yeah, so this is about how you can combine power management and intelligent power management. So the power management, which talks about how the power split is happening between the two sources, has to be made an intelligent power management by combining it with driver assistance systems. So you have data about the driver state, about the vehicle state, and about the road state. And you can use this information to develop a more you know, intelligent or real-time uh, power management. Uh, yeah, so how you do it? You can either have uh, a template-based based method. So you take a few templates, like, a, in a, like you do in a fuzzy logic system. You take a few templates and uh, you say that, okay, fine, when uh, the vehicle velocity is so and so, you say that, okay, fine, this is now the how the driving system is going to behave. Or you can make a model out of it. Like for example, you have Markov modules. Either case, you have to adapt the model or update templates because every time the uh, the vehicle changes its pattern of driving or every time the driver changes its pattern of his pattern of driving, you have to keep adapting the existing templates you have to inculcate the newer patterns which are coming. Uh, there's another author which has talked about a certain kind of uh, driving pattern identification system. So here what they do is they have four modules. One module is called the driving information extractor. And this information extractor is trying to see if uh, what is a driving condition, if it's a, if it's a, you know, what is a type, roadway type, it's a highway type of driving, suburban, urban. So information extractor tries to extract this information. The style extractor tries to extract this information, whether the driver is a calm driver, normal driver, or an aggressive driver. The FTI is trying to split the torque between the motor and the engine, and the SCC is trying to maintain the battery charge. So these four things have to be done by these two blocks, all right? And these two things are going to do the control. So similarly, there's another author, they have used a uh, fuzzy based neural method to find the kind of you know driving pattern which the driver is driving and accordingly they are uh, designing the rule based power management controller there is another final you know example which is on driving pattern prediction so this one is not doing recognition this one is doing prediction so what they are saying is they are saying that okay fine this is the trip we know the trip in advance this is the current time the vehicle is here and it's going to finally go to this position. And if you know this window of the driving, and if you know this trip in advance, then what you can do is, when you are at the current time, then you use, uh, you try to tune your power management controller with the help of optimization algorithms, which will give you a solution for the next time. So you are actually using global optimization techniques at the present time, window so it is very important to select the right size of time window so for how much time are you giving an optimal solution this is one method of you know using predictive power management so this uh, author has done it using again neural networks and uh, using some kind of multi mode trip prediction module okay so this is about driving pattern recognition and driving pattern prediction and their role in power management
I hope I have been able to, you know, give the importance of pattern recognition and pattern prediction in driver assistance systems and in intelligent power management. So, if you have want to summarize my uh, presentation for today, I have talked about safe, secured, and efficient driving. So, what are the driving assistance systems for electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, which can ensure this kind of a framework? What are the basic components? What are the challenges associated with these vehicles? How can you do power split and power management? And finally, the driver assistance system that we are talking about. What is the importance of these assistance systems with relevance to power management? So we talk about driver recognition. We talk about drive pattern recognition. Finally, if this, it can be concluded that you can have a safe, secure, and efficient driving if you combine intelligent power management techniques with driver assistance systems. Okay. So, any questions from anyone? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, this was a wonderful session. Uh, even I, I found a few new points regarding EVs, which was not known before. So now I would like to take a few queries, few points, uh, which were were asked in the chat room by participants. So one by one, I would like to read. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. One question is from uh, Dr. Bal Mukund Sharma ji. Yes. Uh, his question is in battery management system if charging is so fast then if it affects on plate of battery or not and if yes then how it's managed uh, Prime yes. over increase the weight and cost or not that's also written by dr bal mukunji okay so i'll address the first question so yes if charging is fast uh, then it does affect uh, the life of the batteries so it has to be uh, you know it the, the charge has to be the, the the rate of growth of current has to be controlled that is the task of the battery management system so if even if the charging is fast we talk about fast charging as, it, as in how fast is the battery filling up but the slope of the current has to be gradual because otherwise it does affect the life of the batteries so either the battery chemistry has to be so uh, developed that you know you don't allow the plates to decompose you know by charging them fast or the battery management system has to be such that it either i don't know it, it doesn't allow the battery to charge so fast so that is why you know the problem is there in fast charging we don't have fast charging because not because we don't have fast chargers we can always have chargers but the problem is we don't have that kind of batteries which can take that kind of you know fast charging and the other question was uh, what sorry i yeah I, I, that, that's a question uh, from same uh, person prime mover increase the weight and cost or not uh, so prime mover if we are talking about the engine uh, see the prime mover can either be an uh, internal combustion engine it can be electric motor or it can be a fuel cell now each of them are different in different ways so yeah i mean if you don't have an engine in the uh, in the in the system then obviously a lot of weight is reduced because in conventional vehicles the engine along with its subsystems they add on to a lot of bulk but in electric vehicle you don't the associated systems are much smaller the transmission system is hardly there so definitely uh, the prime mover if you're talking about an engine it does add to the weight of the system okay thank you ma'am uh, next one is from sukhvinder Dylan, uh, it is a. I think it is one or two question. I question one is mentioned like SOC is a ratio of releasable capacity slash rated capacity. Full we'll stop. Uh, could you please give more clarification about releasable capacity? If battery is related to ampere hours, whether SOC depends upon current reading during estimation process. If yes, then whether the battery voltage remains constant during estimation process or it degraded as function of load current, time and temperature. Okay, so I'll, uh, it was a very long question. So the first uh, thing is what uh, is the I'm state just, of the I'm, I'm just repeating the question again. The question one is there. SOC is a ratio of releasable capacity slash rated capacity. So the question is, could you please give more clarification okay. about releasable capacity? I think this is the first question. Yeah. 
yeah so i'll take the first question first yeah. so yeah soc has been defined in literature in different ways so the most uh, what should i say um, the most commonly and the most standard definition is that soc is equals to initial soc minus the rated capacity uh, divided by uh, minus the you know the uh, integral of the current divided by the rated capacity so that means so this is the definition given by the ampere r method of uh, soc definition or soc estimation so it means that the soc of the battery depends on the previous soc value and the integral of the current so that divided by the nominal capacity so there are many factors to it so that means if you are not able to estimate the initial soc properly you will not be able to get the correct value of soc if the the nominal capacity of the battery because this is the, the charge holding capacity of the battery is not correct then also you will not get a correct estimation of the soc so charge holding capacity is again directly related to the health of the battery so if the battery is a old battery then the state of charge which you are measuring is has changed because the, the you, you see the problem is that if you have a new battery and if the state of charge is 100% and if you have if you have a if you have a new battery and if the charge is 100% it is very different from if you have an old battery and the charge is still showing 100% because the the charge holding capacity of the battery is still the nominal capacity has changed okay so that is why uh, in the definition if you see the state of charge definition then the nominal capacity of the battery also has to be accurately estimated the health has to be accurately estimated to get a correct estimation of the state of charge okay okay ma'am i think uh, it is uh, covered but again i am reading the rest part of the question if battery is related to ampere hours whether soc depends upon current re reading during estimation process if yes, yes. then whether the battery voltage remains constant during estimation process or it degraded as a function of load current time and temperature yeah so you see the battery voltage and state of charge have a relationship again as you it is quite correctly said that it with time temperature and number of cycles the battery degrades so the uh, the voltage the open circuit voltage will change okay so open circuit voltage has a relationship with the state of charge so that means if the open circuit voltage changes then uh, yeah your charge estimation will also change and current yeah because it is the integral of current so it depends on the current but the the cycles of current which you are giving to it that again will cause some kind of aging cycle you know how much current is going in and out of the battery that causes the battery to again uh, the nominal capacity of the battery to change over time okay okay i i hope uh, uh, <laughs> the Mr. Sukhinder uh, got the answer too. So I am picking the next question, Rishabh Duvedi from Rishabh Duvedi. How can I write MATLAB code for estimation of SOC of lithium-ion battery in real time using EKF? Yeah, so extended Kalman filtering is a is a way of estimating SOC, and just one of the yeah. You know, you can talk to me later about it, or we can discuss it later. but there are two boxes available and you can use the two boxes the extended kalman filtering is just one way of estimating soc okay the from next question is from munish kumar respected ma'am uh, will you please uh, basic of mold predictive control of electric vehicle powered by battery okay model predictive control mpc i think you mean is uh, is a predictive power management and uh, what it does is it actually uh, provides a time window so depending on how the vehicle has been driving basically depending on the historical values and uh, based on you know it's it's an accumulation of information that it uses so based on how the driver has driven in the past it takes that information to construct an estimate of the future driving pattern so take into account many factors one is the past driving pattern there can be other factors also based on those factors it kind of extrapolates a future drive cycle and that's all it does so it just predicts it and then it tries to control the power uh, within the vehicle so that the vehicle power 
is you know power flow is optimized for the next cycle so it will predict and will create uh, an optimal power management which is applicable for the future so that is what it does it okay uh, next one is from divya bharti is there any mathematical expression which stabilizes relation between soc and soh um mathematical relation or i would say uh, yeah that is where the researchers are still uh, going they are trying to develop mathematical relationship between soc and soh but there are many experimental uh, relations or what should i say it all depends on how you define soc and how you define soh so different authors if you look at the papers are different soh in different ways some people are saying that soh is the loss in capacity and the loss in capacity q loss they call it has a dependence on the ampere r so one theory says that q loss changes with the ampere r or the how much uh, you know what is the integral of the current so that way it does have a relationship and some other authors say that okay we have done a variety of experiments and based on the experiments we have um, got some kind of a map so they make a map of parameters how they vary and that is how they try to establish a relationship between soc and soh so there are different definitions of uh, or different laws or different you know methodologies of relating soc and soh but one common method is that they say q loss is equals to uh, something something some constants ah to the power some constant so there is an exponential relationship which which has been established also but there is there are relationships mainly derived from experimental results okay uh next question from ravindra kanojia uh, ma'am since uh, we know that battery life is compromised mm -hmm. is there any new technology for keeping the charge for a long duration uh, okay so good question now this again depends on uh, what kind of vehicle are you co considering so if it's only a battery powered vehicle then you don't have much option so you uh, you can only i mean at the max you can improve the charging of the battery so when you are charging the battery you can have a system battery management system which can improve uh, gradually charge the battery or not you know un allow the battery to undertake very fast transients but otherwise when you are driving it you really cannot help much because the driver performance is also required so unless and until you are ready to compromise with your driving performance that the driver is not allowed to accelerate hard or the driver is not allowed to brake hard or drive in a very aggressive way so if you not if you not cutting on the performance of the vehicle you really have no much not much choice because you have only one power source but if you have a hybridized power source of a battery and a super capacitor let us say, then you have a possibility of extending the battery life because you can allow the super capacitor to take over the you know transients the 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 quick braking the quick acceleration this the, that power can be given by the super capacitor because super capacitor does not have lifetime issues but the battery you can use for a longer period of time with to keep giving gradual you know release of power a gradual kind of process so that is one option yeah i hope that answers your question yes sure ma'am our uh, next question is from sk mishra ji will prime mover can be used in induction motor also uh, you mean can induction motor be used as a prime mover yes it can be used as a prime mover so uh, prime mover is either you have the engine as the prime mover or you have the motor as the prime mover so engine is the prime mover if it's a um, if it's a conventional vehicle or if you have a hybrid vehicle with an engine or if you have a battery powered vehicle then the induction motor is the prime mover battery is the power source and induction motor is the prime mover it's the induction motors are commonly used tesla cars or they are commonly used okay okay thank you uh, next one is from piyush oja ji which torque converter we use in evs electromagnetic or hydraulic Mm, well, I think they use both. Hydraulic torque converters uh, are mostly used in um, uh, hybrid vehicles or conventional vehicles. So, because they have got some, they they have they have very bulky tr transmission. They are not used commonly or with electric vehicles. So, electric vehicles do use electromagnetic transmission. Okay, okay, ma'am. Uh, next one is from Vineet Kumar Sinha ji. Uh, ma'am kindly elaborate on 
P0, P1, P2, ETC. Uh, regarding HEVs, EVs and their implications on vehicles power output efficiency. Uh, one moment, P0 you mean to say which slide uh, or? Uh, maybe in the slide you have uh, as mentioned. You can open the slide ma'am, I think. Can you, can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Ma'am, kindly elaborate on P0, P1, P2, etc. Regarding HEVs, EVs and their implications on vehicles power output efficiency. Mm, I have to see which slide, uh, what is this P0? Uh, uh, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I, uh, the question can be mailed to ma'am directly. If required, then the question can be sent to ma'am and she can uh, answer directly from the mail. If there is some issue here because uh, uh, it is not clear that what is P0, P1 and P2. Yeah, so this slide yes, number Mr. is Vineet, if you are able to listen, then okay, you can unmute and you, would, you can ask the question directly. I mean, I have no issue. Sir, please move to next question. Okay. Uh, from Mukesh Kumarji, what is the life of super capacitor in comparative to battery life? Okay, so super capacitors have a much longer life. It's not that they live forever, but uh, they can withstand, I have forgotten the exact number, but much more, maybe, you know, much more the number of cycles than a battery can. So, uh, they usually do not have the problem of, uh, you know, short cycle life. They can withstand much more, many more cycles uh, than the batteries. Uh, again, the same type of the question from SK Mishra ji. Super capacitor can be used as a battery in series. Uh, sorry, the super capacitor can be used as? As in as battery in series. Uh, yeah, it, so series parallel is a completely different thing. Series parallel means that if you have more than one source, so if you have something like this, if you have a... One moment, I'll just show you. So, series parallel is a different concept. Series parallel means that if you have a battery and a supercapacitor, you have to have a converter, obviously. Then the question is that how are you going to arrange them? So, this is like, for example, a parallel way of arranging. So, if you want to have a series way of arranging, well, then you have to see how you want to do it. For example, here, you, if you talk all this a series, but normally with a DC-DC converter, you don't have series parallel arrangement. You have active passive arrangements. So, uh, this is how they normally a battery and supercapacitor combination. They normally arranged like this. Okay. Okay. This way. Yeah. Uh, next one is: Can suspension work will automated as per the road conditions? Mm, the suspension system. Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, I'm sure mechanical engineers are working on that. Suspension system can definitely be, uh, you know, modified for the road conditions. Why not? Uh, Mr. Ramesh is asking, what are career opportunities for power system engineer in EV? Okay, so you see uh, EVs also talk about, I mean, I have covered one part of EVs which are maybe full electric vehicles, but I have not talked about the grid side. So they have grid connected EVs as well and they have a whole new subject domain over there that how you are going to utilize the grid energy and uh, what kind of load forecast you can do so as to have EVs charging from the grid and also giving power back to the grid. So that domain is completely there for the power system engineers to decide uh, the, how the grid and the EVs can be connected to have a smart ecosystem that is there. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, the next one is again the same type of the question. The research opportunities in the power system for doing PhD is there any? Uh, which is the best induction motor or DC motor for EV? Of course, induction motor. DC motors are not used and they are not a choice. Unless you are talking about BLDC motors. BLDC motors are... Uh, DC motors, uh, they have a DC motor-like construction, but they are given uh, three-phase shifted currents. So, uh, yeah, which one is better? Induction motors are definitely better. They are more robust and uh, they have better performance. Mm. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, as uh, I can see the chat, all the queries has been uh, 
answered well uh, if there are any queries from the youtube because lot of people are maybe engaged from the youtube side dr vikash can ask if there are uh, any queries otherwise i can move to the next part of the fdp uh, i think so no question is from the youtube uh, okay. i have seen the chat box in youtube and no question is from there okay okay thank you uh, i think just i want to check that uh, am i audible to dr himant uh, ahuja my head of department uh i think sir he is uh, uh, on the way is not oh, okay 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 uh, so now i would like to uh, invite uh, dr vikas badoria coordinator fdp uh, abs engineering college for a vote of thanks uh, i request you sir uh, please join us dr vikas badoria uh, very good evening to one and all present on this session uh, it's my uh, honor to uh, vote present the vote of thanks of this uh, five days fdp and in this uh, uh, vote of thanks first i would like to say thank you for all the experts uh, out of those experts one expert is uh, present in today's session thank you ma'am for the today's session yeah thank you too for giving me the opportunity <laughs> uh, thank you ma'am uh, for accepting the invitation and uh, uh, besides uh, today's session there were four other experts i would like to thank to all four experts dr arun verma dr c bharti raja dr ashish shrivastav and dr sanjeev singh in uh, their absentia uh, after that uh, i would like to thank all the participants because uh, without all the participants this uh, fdp has not it cannot be say, uh, said that as a complete fdp so i more than 550 registrations were received uh, during the registration process and out of those 550 around 220 230 and uh, approximately 200 participants were uh, there in approximately each session in today also i am able to see that around 168 participants are there few of them have watched the session on uh, youtube also so uh, a big thank you for all the participants then uh, after that i would like to thank the management of abs engineering college who have uh, provided this opportunity to us uh, so that we can conduct this uh, online ftp then after that i would like to thank you to head of the department of electrical and electronics department uh, dr hemant ahuja he has encouraged us to conduct such type of session in this uh, covid 19 situation then uh, thank you for all the faculty members who have uh, contributed directly and indirectly in the conduction of this fdp and direct contribution is uh, from ms shilpa shambhi and uh, ms nitika ghosh uh, both of them have coordinated uh, three sessions in this fdp after that uh, i would like to thank uh, my partner coordinator uh, dr amit agrawal who has contributed uh, in a, a equally re responsive way or it, he has shared equal responsibility in organizing this fpp after that i would like to thank uh, ajit ji uh, who has designed the poster of this uh, fpp which was uh, circulated to all the participants in, at the initial level and there are many other people also who are involved directly or indirectly i would like to thank all of them uh, i may have missed some of the names but uh, i am thankful to all the persons who were involved in this fdp directly or indirectly thank you all now uh, there is one announcement to participants that i am going to share a feedback link for this session uh, five and after the feedback link i will share a quiz that quiz will consist of 20 questions and uh, those 20 questions will be approximately four questions from the each session so that quiz is mandatory for the certificate purpose as uh, it, it was mentioned in the previous also that certificate will be issued for them only who will participate in the session and the quiz so the quiz session uh, the quiz will be open till uh, tomorrow around 9 or 10 am after that we will start compiling the results and uh, the 
the certificate will be delivered on your mail within a week. And thank you so much, sir. Sure, sir. I will share the link on Telegram also. Thank you, Dr. Vikas. So, again, Vikas sir has completed the things at the end. So, I am again <laughs> thankful to all the participants. And uh, now we can end, but uh, end is another beginning as people say. So, definitely, we all will meet again when the department will initiate and uh, things will go on. Thank you, all the participants. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, thank you. Now, I am here if there is any question from any participants regarding the feedback or uh, quiz. I am here to answer those questions. <laughs>